Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell. You'll get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And when I'm not asking Bruce, hey, how big was Batista's, well, you know. One of the things I like to do is help people save money. And if you're watching this video right now and you're in a 30 year loan, man, you're overpaying your single biggest bill and you may not even realize it. I want you to do a little experiment for me. Take your calculator out, multiply your monthly house payment by 360 payments. That's how many payments there are in a 30 year loan. That big scary number, that's your total of payments. You're looking at that number? You know you can do better. Keep more of your own money right now and go to SaveWithConrad.com. Or maybe you've got credit card debt. Man, it's not a matter of if I can save you money with that. Your average interest rate on a credit card is more than 20%. And by the way, all the interest you pay on those credit cards, it's not tax deductible. Whereas the mortgage interest, well, that is tax deductible. So if you owe this debt, it's up to you how to pay it back. Doesn't it make sense to get the cheapest rate possible and the greatest tax deduction possible? Find out how much money you can save right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com. You don't need perfect credit, even scores in the 500s can be approved, and it's no cost out of pocket. But maybe best of all, we're licensed in more than 40 states. We can help more families than ever before. But how much can we save you? Find out right now for free with a quick quote from SaveWithConrad.com. Hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to my world. And of course we couldn't do it without the hall of famer himself. Double J Jeff Jarrett, Jeff. How are you, man? Conrad Thompson. We are coming off of three or four, five day run. We're going to dive right into this episode. Oh, you didn't know it's dropping lots of good stuff going on. Mania week, two good shows, stage show. Uh, lot WrestleCon appearances, baseball appearances being announced. WrestleQuest.com is rock and rolling. But Conrad, I cannot, and I'll be serious here, I cannot quit thinking about Cassio. You mean that you slapped the shit out of him? No. I mean, I literally, I get emotional thinking about it. Well, because there's all kinds of emotion, but I, I it's it, in, in a lot of ways, it's painful to think about him because he's killing Cause my people. freaking hand, specifically my thumb is still throbbing right now. It's still hurting. <laughs> oh, it's a, it's a good kind of bruise. That's a Will Smith slap. <laughs> I think yours was more of a, a more. Yours was more real than his was my God. It sounded oh, like God, Rad. We had a good time Friday, didn't we? Most of us did. Yes, sir. I don't know about Cassio. I don't know that that's <laughs> something he expected. I mean, he, he probably had an, an inclination when I told him to say that joke, but then when you came out very aggressively, it, uh, aggressively, that was very aggressive. No, no, sir. No, sir. Uh, you know what? And you can all trace it back. It's your fault. I really? just get that right on the table. Hundred percent. Okay. What did you think of Mania? What did you think of Mania? Uh, I thought it was a fun show. I mean, I, I know that um, you know there was some debate about should it be two nights and all that, but I'll tell you this: I thought night one when it was over, I, I left happy, and I did the same thing for night two. This year's WrestleMania to me can be described in one word: fun. Uh, I yeah. felt like both nights were fun. They both delivered. And, uh, my big takeaway and Lord, we saw a bunch of great stuff. How about Cody? His post about it's a love story. Mm -hmm. It's it, the emotion that goes into our industry in a lot of ways was summed up just on the music hitting and him rising up on the ramp. You, 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 I don't say you should have stopped there, but you could have stopped there and soaked in all the emotion. Can I tell you a little story? Yeah. So we went over and, uh, Karen and, and Cody, Cody loves Ray Mysterio. Uh, this is my Cody for, for clarification, my Cody, my son, Cody, um, Loves him some Ray Mysterio and always has Ray gave him a mask way back when and signed up. Anyway, he loves everything. So 
Um, that's the match he wanted to go. And it had been a long three days. He saw AAA. He saw Impact and WrestleCon. And he bugged Cardona all weekend and all that. So he was already, I don't want to say running on fumes, but, you know, he had had a full three days. But um, so he, he, he loved the Mysterio. And there were several things that night. But, um, and I told Karen, I said, look, we're going to beat the traffic. Uh, or do you want to? And she's like, I don't care. Anyhow. He cried. He cried when Cody Rhodes came up through uh, the, the, the the lift. And Karen was like, wow, she's got it on video. And uh, so, no, that, 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 uh, the whole night. And actually, uh, I thought both nights, uh, I got a phone call um, from a buddy of mine and, and uh, who's a big jackass um, fan, huge, and has been for 15, however long they've been around. And he was just loving all that. And he goes, now, what do you think about that? You think this is just like, has a place. I, I know probably it's not your cup of tea. And I said, wait a minute. I said, without that, I, I love Sammy Zane, but you take Sammy Zane and that 15 or 20 minutes in entertainment. And I get that's not everybody's cup of tea, but without that cup of tea, I don't think the edge AJ, I, I just think it all works together. And you man, Conrad, Tip my hat to you. Fun. The the back-to-back -back nights and Stone Cold and how they paid off Vince and the Stunner and McAfee was fantastic. Um Logan Paul. I just it was a it was it it was a spectacle. I I I really uh in a maybe this is a corny kind of way, but maybe not. Proud to be a part of the industry. ATT Stadium. Back to back nights. We're still in a lot of ways. You still fo see folks in Dallas wearing masks, which to me, to each his own, but a sign that, you know, pandemic's not over in a lot of people's mind. Yeah. And the, the lack of international fans in Dallas uh, was, um, you know, candidly hit some folks in the pocketbook because they just didn't travel. And they're a big component of WrestleMania weekend. So, um, I just thought uh, an incredible spectacle, uh, back to back nights and, and for us to get to do our stage show and WrestleCon to be the huge success it was and seven or eight wrestling shows. I think Cardona said he worked four times in three days and GCW and the last outlaw, uh, on video made a little cameo. So a lot of moving parts this weekend, Conrad, did you have a good time? I had a great time. Excited to be back though. And excited to be talking about, uh, two new podcasts that were announced at our event. I can't believe this is real, but <laughs> Brian James, Brian Armstrong, the road dog, the real double J the roadie, whatever you want to call him. We can now call him podcaster. He's starting a podcast with Ryan Katz, who has a resume that you would not believe. Uh, I'll let him share all of that, but most of us know him as a behind the scenes guy with WWE for so long. And now you've got a guy who was there in the territory days, a guy who did enhancement work for WCW, a guy who defended our country overseas, a guy who was a part of this hokey pokey WWF Jeff Jarrett relationship, a guy who was oh, arguably yeah. the spirit behind DX, a lot of the creativity that we saw was, was from his mind. And that spilled out in a major way, not just with what we saw in the ring and his rap, by the way, as he, uh, introduced himself and badass Billy Gunn was probably one of the most celebrated moments of that era on every single show. But besides all that, then you've got, Oh, SmackDown head writer. Oh, was a part of NXT, a really phenomenal opportunity for Oh, you didn't know just talking about the good old days of professional wrestling and some more recent interesting times. Uh, for instance, he told us on stage, he was one of our surprise guests. I could not believe this was real, but, uh, he told us on stage that oftentimes Vince McMahon would change the finish of a match in the middle of the match. He would pull the headset to the side and say, "Never mind, So-and-so needs to go over. Put the headset back on and the match continues, which is just crazy to me in this era where we think, boy, everything's scripted and discussed. And they spent all afternoon putting together their match. And 
worked with an agent on the high spots, but then in the middle of it, nope, change my mind, do something else. Well, what finish should we do? Oh, they'll figure it out. What? Uh, that little nugget and so much more you're going to hear on. Oh, you didn't know. I think Brian is poised to be like a sleeper podcast hit because in real life, man, how can you not just crack up with that guy? <laughs> He, he reminds me a lot of Bruce in that regard. He's a natural storyteller. He's a natural ball buster. He did it all. This is going to be a fun show, man. It starts later this week. Oh, you didn't know anywhere you enjoy podcasts with him and Ryan Katz. It surprised you about the Vince story, huh? Well, I mean, yes and no. It yeah. surprises me that nothing surprises me, but my gosh i mean just think about what we're talking about here like there's everything so meticulous and blah 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 nope not the case change it change my mind and look i've known him been best buds for a long long time but uh at wrestlecon we got to hang out and you know you just see i mean honky tonk man to cardona and brian meyer i mean just lucha star uh, just the whole gamut was there but brian would often say oh man uh L ellsworth was was a name that came up somehow somewhere in the conversation and i'm like oh you were a part of that and he goes oh man and he goes into i won't tell the story here i'll let him but over the last 10 11 12 years i think uh the story behind the story on on, on some fascinating stuff i think will go wow you know conrad you, you have said to me and you've said it publicly you know my story's a little different mm -hmm. third generation i not only wrestled just the different hats brian likewise has worn a lot of different hats um his quick wit is is, is hilarious um his military service uh changed the trajectory of his life there's some fascinating tidbits uh about smoky mountain and just I mean, not only the son of a wrestler, he's the baby brother <laughs> of four kids, four boys who all wrestled, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, uh, he just recently in the last 12 months, maybe a little bit longer than that, you know, lost his mother and his father. Uh, so mama Gail was a saint. So yeah, fascinating story. Um, I'm looking forward to it. A lot of fun, a lot of things, uh, that it's appropriately titled about, Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> and he'll deliver on that. Check it out. Oh, you didn't know. Uh, and while we were there, uh, unbelievably, Mr. William Regal announced that he too would be starting a podcast. Gentleman villain is available for you to hit the subscribe button. He told the story. I don't think the world has ever heard about Sid. I don't want to spoil it here. Cause I'm sure we're going to talk about it on his podcast, but my goodness, boy, you story, ain't that guy has to tell. And that's not like a cute story. That's not like a fun, silly story. It starts that way. But then when he finishes, you're like, oh, mm -hmm. uh, stay tuned. Lots of fun stuff coming your way. But today we're here talking about you putting a bow on this double J storyline in your own way. You're going to be returning to the USWA. We're going to maybe talk a little bit of Smoky Mountain and we got before we get too deep into today's topic, I guess we should remind everybody, nobody technically owns a lot of this footage that we're going to be talking about. So we can't sincerely say, go watch it here or there. Cause Lord, who knows who really owns it? Well, I will <laughs> say this, a lot of this stuff is on YouTube and we've actually collected it for you. So you can go to my world, uswa.com. We'll have the link in the description too. So to be clear, we don't own these videos. We haven't produced these videos. We haven't uploaded these videos, but we have found them on YouTube, curated them, if you will. They're all in one spot now, myworlduswa.com. Uh, so we want you to be able to take a look at this stuff. But before we talk about it, I took a look at the feedback and we got overwhelming feedback about our Lance Russell episode. Did we know it? And I, it made me warm my heart, uh, backstage Saturday at mania Conrad, I had some guys come up to me that had heard about Lance and even had some one guys that I've always 
heard others do Lance impersonations and all that kind of stuff. They were, they, it, it, it made my, you know, cause Lance's legacy. Um, I got a text from Lance's son. Um, I, I share that with you, Conrad. I don't know if I told you that. I got you did. A, you yeah. sent me okay. a great text message screenshot. We also got a great email. Uh, David Nanny wrote this to us. Jeff, I listened to the podcast today. It was great as usual. People not from here don't understand Saturday mornings in Memphis from 11 to 1230. If you went to Raleigh Springs mall and visited radio shack, every TV for sale had wrestling on traffic was light in Memphis from 11 to 1230. Lance was the star and the host. He opened the show with the patented yellow, everybody Lance storm and Dave Brown, right alongside. He was obviously in every segment, making you believe that a win over rough and ready or freezer Thompson actually meant something as he worked to get over every single person in the ring. The subtlety of the man is seen in the interview when Lawler and flair were in studio and Jerry asked if the young guy in the ring had ever won a match. He's supposed to face flair. Lance puts his head down, shakes it and says, not that I can recall Jerry, not hell. No, he's a jobber. It was that subtle, almost resignation to the fact that he had to recognize that the enhancement talent had never won. He was an extra uncle to many of us. Saturday mornings were special. You organized your Saturday around it. You didn't have a noon wedding. You didn't start watching football with Keith Jackson until wrestling went off, etc. But the one thing many people don't understand is the legitimacy that Lance and Dave gave the show. Take for instance, the three times I know Lance got involved in an angle physically Dundee slapped him during the bill and buddy year dream machine tackled him and got in his face over the alley-oop video shown about dream machine, which obviously didn't sit well. The third time I was, I think when you and someone else dumped yellow paint on Tojo Tojo came out to presumably beat up Lance Lance grabbed a hammer. And said, you may beat me up, but I'm getting one shot in and I'm hitting you right in the face. And we talked about these moments for hours. Imagine a Chris Hardwick or a Ryan Seacrest being tackled on stage. I've often told Kevin that Lance, Dave, Jerry Calhoun, who's really the third Jerry, Eddie Marlin, Mr. Coffee, your dad, et cetera, were the mortar and caulk in the building. Lance may have been more of a part of the foundation, but you get the point. In Memphis to this day, if I meet someone from that era, whether they be black, blue collar, white collar, whatever, if you can somehow work Saturday morning wrestling into the conversation, all walls and fences are instantly dropped. You have something in common. Next thing you know, you're in a rabbit hole talking about the numerous stories that everyone has in common. Lance was the narrator of all that. Lance, John Ward, Keith Jackson, and Vin Scully were the soundtracks of my childhood. Really a beautiful email from listener, David Nanny. And, uh, I think he summed it up. Well, man, what a legacy. I got that email and just you reading it back. Uh, you get a, it's corny, <clears throat> almost a lump in your throat because he, um, the thing that I love more than anything is if you can work it into the conversation, all walls drop and that in 2022 is pretty damn cool. I agree that, that, you know, in 2022, if we could collectively, and I'm gonna, gonna get on a soapbox, but man, talk about the solutions in life, as opposed to the problems and Memphis wrestling and Lance. And that was really, it was a special email and, and, and it, it struck me. It really did. So I'm glad you shared it today, Conrad. Go check it out. If you haven't already. Uh, man, the love for Lance was real and, uh, I'm excited for us to be a part of what we're doing today because we're picking up where we left off a couple of months ago, we touched on a feud where Jeff, you're going to have a, a hiatus in the WWF here in 1995 and Meltzer would say this. This is from the August 14th, 1995 observer. Jeff Jarrett is still sitting it out and the two sides are further apart at this point than they were one week ago at press time. No progress had been made between the two sides and Jarrett is attempting to get out of his contract and entertain offers at that point, because right now nobody can dare talk to him 
or risk a tampering lawsuit. Usually when a guy leaves the WWF while under contract, the promotion lets him work anywhere, but WCW like Brian Armstrong, he's already working with smoky mountain wrestling, but some feel because of the nature of what happened, they may keep Jarrett from working USWA. According to Jerry Jarrett, his son was unhappy about being portrayed as a phony singer and a phony business and thought that it would make his career go to the same place. Millie Vanilli's did. And at this point, WCW who Jerry Jarrett works for has made no inquiries about getting Jeff. Now that is the report in the observer. What was really going on here? Uh, just to catch folks up or if they maybe dove in and hadn't l- listened to the other episodes, just a, a quick reset, July of 95, uh, me versus Shawn Michaels in your house too, actually in Nashville, I dropped the title, uh, and, uh, pl- as planned, uh, but didn't carry through with the angle where it exposed me, uh, as not singing the song and road dog as singing the song, the creative, push come to shove is I thought it was way too soon. I had voiced my opinion multiple times on different, uh, occasions, obviously not loud enough, not clear enough, or Vince just didn't really care. Uh, I think when we got down granular on it, uh, neither side felt like they were heard, but nonetheless, I walked out that night. And so we're only a month in, and it was real quick that I left probably the following week. My attorney contacted their attorney or their attorney contacted us and whatever it was, but it was basically, Hey, let's let cooler heads prevail. They had to go on and run their TVs. And I was in a lot of ways burnt. I had been on the road, uh, since October of 93 with very little, no breaks, none, um, not an excuse, just kind of my reality, uh, for that time frame during my life and, uh, went home. And so, you know, Dave wrote, and I understand it. He's got to put a little flavor in there about things were worse or however he phrased it, but there was just a cooling off period. Um, and I wasn't interested in working anywhere at the time. Uh, we're, we're a month into this situation. You, uh, dated it August of 95 and I wasn't really interested in doing anything except some rest and relaxation. It was summertime. The lake was right here. It was hot. Uh, and, and I didn't have anything on my mind other than let me just chill for a little bit. A month in, is that when you, when did you start saying, I'm going to start getting ready to take my contractor test? (sighs) Conrad, I, it was almost, I I'd say within seven to 10 days or two weeks that, you know, my dad and I get it from him, no patience. Uh, what's next? Hey son, if you're just going to be sitting around the house, dad, I, I've been working a lot. Just for like, he's, why don't you sit around? And he sort of sold me on the idea. Um, you know, uh, I'm in the development business. Why not go get your contractor's license? And I thought, okay, I can do that from home. And I did some research and knew I had to take a seminar or two. And, uh, I agreed to do that. So it was really quick, actually, that I, that I thought about it, taking it. What'd you think of, uh, Brian already working with Smoky mountain? Were you in touch with, uh, Cornette? How did he get that? Was that just through his dad bullet? So Bob I, and Cornette? I, I don't know the exact communication, but look, bullet was a part of Smoky mountain. Um, and, and, and did big business with them. And so Cornette running the show there and, you know, me and Brian from a contractual point of view and, and really where we were at on the card, uh, it's hard to imagine, but Brian as valuable as he was as the roadie, he was still six months into his deal. Uh, had a couple of situations when uh, marijuana was not legal <laughs> on the test. And so his contractual situation and mine were really different. And our year to date earnings were radically different. And so I don't know exactly. I'm sure on, Oh, you didn't know they can probably get into that. And he's probably got much better recall on that, but it was like, it, it happened and he went right to work for those guys because he had to make a living it, it, for lack of a better word. He, he had to go make some money and with his relationship uh, or his father's relationship, existing relationship at the time, uh, he just stepped right in and, uh, went to work. Does your dad have any hesitation about using you in the USWA to the best of your recollection? Best of my recollection. I don't think he was doing anything day to day. I think Randy was was much more Randy Hales, 
what was was basically I will we'll say making the towns and I think Lawler you know was I'll, I'll say overseeing Saturday mornings and and that kind of uh, that 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 deal uh and my dad had just started the consulting deal with WCW in that time frame I believe uh so I don't think it was even a point of discussion at this stage. We've talked a lot about the relationship with your dad. Something we haven't talked a lot about is your relationship with Jerry Lawler. Were you talking to Lawler at all? Well, you, you know, he's working with the WWF and there's a USWA connection with the WWF and your dad's working largely with WCW and you're doing some contract or license stuff, but you grew up around Jerry Lawler. Do you call Jerry? Does he call you or does that not happen here? It doesn't really, it doesn't happen. You know, it was, he was doing his thing. And again, there was a really big cool and off period. Uh, obviously hindsight's 2020, uh, I could have handled the situation, uh, much differently on the communication level, but it, it's not like I, I, I quit and like, I'm never going to wrestle again, or I'm going to WCW or I'm going to Japan. It was, no, I don't want to do this angle at all. Matter of fact, I think it's very detrimental to my career. So much so, I don't want to do it. I'm just going to go home with no plan in place. It's crazy to think about that you were willing to. Yes. I, I just, that, that's kind of the, uh, the whole meat of, of, of everything in that, look, I didn't have the, 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 the knowledge that, Millie Vanilli's situation and people that don't know Millie Vanilli, they lip synced a number one hit. Uh, and when they were exposed as not singing the song, they couldn't, they, they, it was game set match. Their career was instantaneously over. Now I didn't have the knowledge of that moving forward, but I did know that from the double J vignettes and the whole foundation of the character was built on greatest singer, greatest entertainer, greatest wrestler. And I'd moved into that IC slot. And so my wrestling skills were, were, were coming. There was some validity to that, but the, I thought the singing was, it got over immediately. Brian can sing his ass off. The video was done. Perfect. Let's not kill this character's sort of foundation right out of the gate. I didn't like that creatively. And then behind the scenes, the, um, Brian willing to play ball with the rules. He, he wasn't at the time. And so that really concerned me that we're going to do this angle and not have a talent to work with. So it was kind of a double-edged sword. What do you think the Monday night wars, if anything, do you think they had any sort of impact on Memphis? I mean, Memphis wrestling was such a big part for so long, but the style of, of wrestling, the studio show live in the morning, mostly enhancement matches, but you got some big angles and whatnot, but now Monday night raw, it even had, well, mostly enhancement matches, but we had some big competitive matches, but boy, when nitro comes now we're having big time competitive matches head to head. Do you think that had any effect on what was happening in Memphis? <sighs> You know, at WrestleCon Conrad, I had several folks come up and ask me about the researchers again. But so I'm, I'm segueing into doing the research or reading the research on this episode. And I had, uh, for this specific episode, I actually reached out to Randy Hales and just said, Hey, Randy, give me a, a little bit of a recap on because I know you were intricately, you know, there and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then, and looking at Derek's notes and just sort of walking through all this, it's, it's very easy to answer right now. Oh my God. It wasn't a nail or it wasn't the nail. It was like, a an electric air gun nails in the coffin on Memphis, not Memphis wrestling, but the town of Memphis on Monday nights, because it was, I mean, it, it was really tough. Now I think. Nothing happens overnight. We've got the, uh, the luxury of looking at things years past, but when raw came on and debuted on Monday nights, the mid South Coliseum, that certainly escalated because it gave wrestling fans an alternative. And even though it may have been from the Manhattan center and then labor Trattle, but wrestling wrestling happened on Monday nights, the big time. 
and the, 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 the talent from it, Savage and whoever else you want to name. So get the train of raw going and then get the, uh, supersonic jet fuel that nitro and the competitive natures. Yes. It, 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 it gave a, a very, very, very clear of major league minor league. Look, I mean, it, it's just that simple. You mentioned the studio. I mean, this past Saturday and Sunday night, when you're having a wrestling ring on at at t stadium, it, it, it clearly, it, 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 you know, that's, the grandest stage of them all. It's not, it's not a marketing line. That's the real deal. And, and so we're all being a traveling show and WMC MC studios that was known forever and ever and ever. It was real quick, um, identifiable to the wrestling fan, major league, minor league. Brian James is going to be renamed in the USWA. Uh, of course, he's been doing some stuff with Smoky Mountain, but when he pops up here for the USWA, he's going to be known as Jesse James Armstrong. Feels like you guys are having a little fun with that real double J stuff here, huh? <laughs> you know, I, I can't wait to hear Brian's recall on this, but um, Jesse, uh, you know, his real name is Brian Gerard with a G. Uh, so, the James gang. Well, let me say this. His real name is Brian Gerard James. So his last name is James. So Jesse, I'm not real sure where he came up with Jesse, but he came up with it. Obviously Armstrong, the longstanding name of the bullet Bob Armstrong. So, yep. He was, uh, he was a double J. So your family, the Jarrett's and the Armstrong's, they're going to somehow start feuding between Smoky mountain and the USWA. Is this a forgiveness rather than permission type situation for you? The idea that you're still technically under contract, but you're going to start working well out here. No, I, 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 without question, um, the attorney I had at the time, I don't want to say didn't, he, he was very, I mean, he, he, he's an attorney. He didn't come from within the industry. And he got everything cleared. It, it wasn't, I got permissions. What I'm saying that this wasn't asked for forgiveness. We asked for permission and, and, and with Lawler that, you know, when I, you know, again, looking back on it now with Lawler there on Monday nights and he owns the territory and the territory being way down and Lawler can't make Monday nights cause he's doing raw. So, you know, if, if I don't know that the conversation took place, but it was, Hey man, what's Memphis going to hurt? And they're developing talent down there. And, you know, not long over this, a kid named flex Cavana came through and a bunch of other talent slid, slid through there. So, but we got permission. I wasn't going to do anything, um, to stir up or put gas on the fire with my contractual situation. At this stage, I literally was like, let me just, let's just cool off and, and, and figure things out and come back together and try to figure it out. I just didn't want to do the angle. So, um, I don't say playing nice, but no, it, it wasn't asking, uh, looking for the opportunity to ask for forgiveness. If they opposed to it, we asked for permission. Let's, uh, let's talk about the creative because this is going to be something that's going to be challenging. Something that a lot of us saw start on WWF TV. Now, maybe we're going to play it out on another TV, but maybe it's both Smoky Mountain and USWA. The result, some pretty good stuff. The Observer says this, the 1111 TV show was the best in a long time. The main angle started with the tape from uh, November 4th in Nashville, where Bob Armstrong was facing Eddie Marlin, who, by the way, is Jeff's grandfather. As Marlin gained the advantage, the SMW crew attacked him, and he was locked in a figure four leg lock. Then they aired a clip from the 10th in Crenshaw where we had JJ, uh, or, or starting with JJ Armstrong. So double J Armstrong, not Jeff Jarrett making fun of Marlon because he was walking with a cane based on the old Nashville angle. Armstrong then jumped Marlon and beat him up again and put him in a figure four. Bob Armstrong does a phone interview where he says that, uh, <laughs> 
from the Bahamas. He's going to be challenging the USWA to put up its promotion against Smoky Mountain Wrestling with his son representing Smoky Mountain against anyone the USWA could put up, saying his son has already beat everyone in the USWA and he doesn't think that anyone will accept the challenge. So the Armstrong family is beaten up on the Jarrett family and old bullet draws a line in the sand promotion versus promotion. what did you think of that creative? So Conrad, um, the, the links put together, what would you say? It's going to be my world, uh, my world, USWA.com mm-hmm. folks, go check these out. Cause there's a link in there. This first link we're talking about is, uh, the, the TNA fans of the asylum. We were in the, that, that was in the asylum when Eddie Marlin got beat up. And if you'll, uh, you know, you noted we're into November now. So we went from August of that year, you know, September, October, I'm probably off getting my contractor's license chilling. Uh, it's getting cold outside. So late time's over. Uh, but no, uh, about getting back to work and whether Lawler had the conversations with WWF at the time, nonetheless, uh, we're getting things cranking and, um, you know, researching all of this and looking at it, I had kind of forgotten that these were the dying days or the final days of smoky mountain Yeah, going on, but bullet, you know, they had been running that and he did the phone in and uh, you know, it's episodic storytelling and promotion versus promotion. And, you know, bullet Bob Armstrong in Memphis, he goes back to the seventies at one time. Bob had moved his entire entire family to Nashville. So Bob had worked for Nick Goulas, had worked for my father. He, you know, the Armstrong name had been uh, in this territory uh, for quite some time. And now here we are, the second generations uh, of Bob and Jerry. It's uh, Jeff and Brian. So good old wrestling storyline, promotion versus promotion. And, and, and what do you know? Bullet Bob was on the beach in the Bahamas. Who would have thought? <laughs> So, uh, later in the show, a gift box addressed as being from the Bahamas for double J Armstrong. When he opens the box, it's double J inside the real double J Jeff Jarrett. The two are going to brawl all over the studio, out the door, through the aisles, into the parking lot. And finally in front of the studio until Jarrett chases Armstrong down union Avenue. Jarrett got a huge pop and did an interview saying that people thought he deserted the USWA these past two years, but what happened was every wrestler's dream was achieved. It was to wrestle in the main event of Madison square garden. He finally achieved that dream, but he felt he'd given up too much. Said he missed seeing his younger brother's high school football season last year. He missed his sister's college graduation when his grandmother was on his, was on her deathbed and he flew in, he had to fly back out the next morning. And she doesn't even remember him being there. He wasn't proud of what he had given up to achieve his dream. But when he heard about what happened to Marlon, that was it. He said Armstrong was a fake name that he came up with because he always wanted to be double J and that his real name is Brian Gerard James said he could have picked any wrestler in the world to be his roadie, but he made the roadie and the roadie kept screwing up. He blamed the USWA isn't like Smoky Mountain because it doesn't have big money backers behind them. But Smoky Mountain doesn't have any wrestlers who can uh, back up all that money. So nice little promo, nice little payoff. And I like the, the little tinge of realism in there. Yeah, I got to go wrestle in the main event of Matt because you're trying to explain in reality who leaves that to come home. But when you talk about, well, here's what I missed of my family and that wasn't worth missing all this, that makes total sense. And what do you know? You were this hateable character in the WWF, but back here in the USWA, white meat, baby face Jones. I can hear simply irresistible in the background, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. And and then an Applebee's commercial to follow up. (laughs) Um, when I watched this clip back, Conrad, you can see how in the box, but, uh, it's got two address to the J and you know, uh, when I watch Brian's mannerisms, but real, real quick, I'm going to talk about the box. You see it's addressed to Brian James from the Bahamas. That's Jerry Lawler's artwork and dry writing. And I mean, he, he's the one backstage who, you know, he's, he's a freaking artist, the best I've ever seen. And he pulled out his Sharpies and had this big box that I had to fit under, but he made it 
legible and you could read it on TV. And it's a little subtlety that just played for the, you know, we, we didn't have a prop department. Our prop department was Jerry Lawler <laughs> and, and, and finding some box. I, I don't know where they found the box, but, but anyhow, uh, when I watch Brian's mannerisms, of course, he's grown up in the business, but this was his first real, he was the lead horse. And there's, a, there's a difference between a roadie or a second or in a tag team wrestling, maybe having the more experienced partner, but Brian was the guy, he was the lead heel in the territory and how he carried himself. Um, I'm not saying he didn't get the ball in Smoky mountain, but his father and brothers were around. It, it, here in, in, in this story on USWA, it, he was the guy. And, um, I was impressed by watching it back. Like, yep. He's, he's got a skill set like none other. Um, but we were off and running the box. <laughs> I came out of that. I'm sure. We're going to get a, a cornet comment here in a minute. Um, but it, it was a lot of fun. It kicked things off going back to Lance. If, if you hear Lance, his cadence on the call and, he just had, he was, he just had that cool hand Luke call, but showed emotion when needed and just so good. So get even more from the hottest new podcast going my world with Jeff Jarrett over at adfreeshows.com. Let me get granular here for a minute, folks. Not only can you get the entire my world episode library with zero ads, new episodes come your way each week early ad free and on video starting at just nine bucks a month. We've also got tons of exclusive My World bonus content waiting for you, plus unique interactive experiences with your old pal, Double J. You get to jump on and ask Jeff questions, and if you joined us in Chicago this year for Top Guy Weekend, you got to hang out the entire weekend. 100% the best value in all of wrestling. Strut on over to adfreeshows.com right now to sign up. Is it true that anybody who comes out of a box is instantly over? Well, who are you asking? You asking me or Jim Cornette? Jim Cornette says, yes, I'm asking you double J. Where did that get started? It was just a booking meeting when they wanted chainsaw Charlie to cut his way out. When he, when he pitched it, everyone looked at him like, why a box? And apparently he was incredulous. Of course, this story gets ramped up. I'm sure, but I'm, I'm sure. Yes. When you garnish it up, it's, are you kidding? Of course, everybody who comes out of a box is instantly over. Everybody knows that. It was just this matter of fact thing, but you know, according to Bruce, Jim had a lot of those where someone tried to rib, uh, Cornette once and handcuff his stuff somewhere. So no big deal. He just reached in his wallet and pulled out his, uh, his handcuff key and let himself free. And of course, Bruce is like, you have a handcuff key <laughs> and allegedly Cornette's like, yeah, everybody carries a hand, a handcuff key, Bruce. Duh. <laughs> one of those wrestling deals yes one of those wrestling deals keep my wife's no it's just a wrestling deal so right after this on november 13th you finally have your big blow off you didn't want against jesse james armstrong this time it's in memphis with you two headlining and i'd say the blow off you didn't want because you were worried about how the creative would be handled with the wwf or maybe because of a drug test or whatever but at least here, maybe you feel like, you know, you have a little more control, right? It's a completely different storyline and the singing's not involved and the personal issue was involved and family against family and my redemption story, if you will, the baby face that comes back home that, that had abandoned to some folks eyes that I'd gone off to the big apple and done my thing. So completely different set of stakes, completely s different set of the entire story and certainly the financing, uh, financial component of this was far, far, far less lucrative, uh, than had we done it with the WWF. Meltzer is very complimentary of your stuff. He says that your return was fantastic. The interview might have been the best interview of your career. The stipulations where the winner gets the promotion. Um, there's just a lot of great stuff here, but you're competing now with hmm. nitro you're competing with monday night raw and as a result there's only 1200 fans here in the arena um Meltzer would say it was the best match in memphis in a while uh, you win in 20 minutes and 11 seconds and that means the uswa is now supposed to own smoky mountain wrestling 
you remember being disappointed that there were only 1200 fans there? Yes and no. Um, the, the reality of the situation, because I mean, Memphis now, so we're in end of 95 Conrad in, and we've covered this on some of the USWA and daddy buys Dallas and, um, a couple of these different episodes, 89, 88, 89, 90. I mean, the whole Austin story, the paychecks, the territory had been down for three, four, five years. I mean, at the end of the day, have I had, I've been making a really good living in the territory. I probably would have never gone to the WWF in 93, but that just wasn't the reality. So yes, I'm sure I was disappointed that it didn't jump more than it did, but I also knew the reality of it, that it's uh tough times. You know, we're, we're 10 years at least into Hulkamania running wild. And so major league, minor league, um, we were perceived, and I'm going to say we, the Memphis territories, uh, territory, and, and that we, we were, we were well known by this point, we were the feeder system to the big leagues, you know, the Steiners, you name it. There's a long list by this point, the undertaker, Mark Calloway had been through soul taker. We could go on and on about folks that came through the territory and they were either working for the WWF or WCW at the time. You guys do a, a series of promos here. Um, and, and, and you're even doing like a sit down. You are with, uh, with Lance, uh, we're not going to play the, the whole clip. We do have it linked, but in the middle, uh, Lance is going to throw to some words from road dog. And I want to give everybody a chance to hear this. This is November 18th, 1995. This is on USWA TV. We're going to track a little bit of this. I think you're going to dig it. That preparation was there and you made it pay off. Well, as you can well imagine, Jesse James Armstrong wasn't too happy about the whole affair. <laughs> Sit right here with me a minute. And let's take a listen and hear what he has to say. If you can understand his ranting, take a listen. Double J, Jeff Jarrett, you robbed me. Everybody here knows it, and everybody there knows it. Double J, you and all your USWA cronies robbed me and my father of the Smoky Mountain organization. Well, it's not going to stand, and you're not going to stand for long, Double J. Yeah, the road dog is talking to you now. Remember when I used to talk to you? I used to help you. I carried you from the slums of the World Wrestling Federation and put you on top of the mountain. I did it. I, Jesse James, that new age outlaw, robbed Ray. Ramon and gave the title to you. I felt like Robin Hood stealing from the rich and giving to the poor. Well, now it's all coming down this week. Organization and organization versus my hair. USWA and Smoky Mountain versus this head full of hair. Double J, Jeff Jarrett, you got another thing coming. This week, I'm going through you like a runaway freight train, and nothing short of a brick wall or a nine millimeter is going to stop me. You are going down. <laughs> he called himself a new age outlaw in there. How about that? Jeff, you're muted. Sorry, pal. I was drinking me some coffee. Apologies. Uh, but no, uh, I, I caught the new age outlaw comment also called something about the mountain king of the, uh, you didn't say king of the mountain, but anyway, um, but no, taking a step back. That was a hell of a fired up, and yes, it may be a wrestling promo, but um, oh, Gerard has always had a way with words. Wasn't it quick witted Friday? <laughs> so many great stories. There's one about Miss Jackie having to drive him that I hope we get to hear on the podcast. Oh, you didn't know? Hit subscribe there. Uh, it's interesting to note, though, to me that he's calling himself the new age outlaw years before we heard that term in the WWF. Um, you guys had 1,150 fans. Jesse gets the win this time. Uh, he gets to keep his hair and gain control of the company back. But this is some classic stuff, man. You know, the, the, the booking for the heat, the run-ins, this is all Memphis one-on-one, is it not? It, you know, and I like to say instead of Memphis one-on-one, a lot of ways it's episodic storytelling. Yes. In so many ways, how our industry works, you know, you, you, you know, I hate to keep going back to the analogy, but it's all fresh on my mind. KO had done that for weeks. Sami Zayn had done that for weeks. Uh, we could go down the list uh, of, of different and you give them the payoff, you know, 1100 fans in Memphis 
not real good, but on a weekly set of, you know, circumstances over a month, we had four or 5,000 paying customers over three months, multiply that times three, you know, so it's, it's just the episodic nature of the business, but it wasn't the, uh, the big, uh, 10 pole event, but, uh, yeah, I, I just still love hearing th those kind of promos from Brian and he's a year or two into the industry. I know he grew up, grew up in it, but still, um, good old wrestling, Connie, good old wrestling. Let's, uh, let's keep it going here and let's talk about what's next because there's a promo that your father's going to cut on TV and then you follow up, uh, on that. And your dad says, or, or Meltzer says that this is probably one of the best of your career. Randy Hale asked me if I would, uh, make a few comments about the big match between Jeff Jarrett and Brian Armstrong and everything we got is on the line. I appreciate the opportunity of being with you this morning. And, uh, First, I think I need to tell you a little bit uh, about Bob Armstrong and I. We were traveled up and down the roads together, and we were both very young. And, and I have to tell you, I really liked Bob. He was a fun guy, and, and we had some good times together. Somewhere along the road, uh, we came to a fork, and he went his way, and I went mine. Well, we traveled our separate roads. We. Uh, we both matured into men and went into old men. Along the way, like trees, we grew our roots and he produced his acorns, his children, and I produced mine. Now we come to an back together. We're at an intersection. I was traveling in one direction and I'm traveling in another. I don't know how Bob raised his children, and he sure don't know how I raised mine. But there's an old saying, and it's never been more true, that acorns don't fall far from the tree. You know, this crazy situation, and I know some of you fans think it's crazy with so much being on the line, so much at stake. Randy Hales and Jeff came to me and told me the kind of pickle they were in. Oh, I snorted and screamed and hollered and cussed a little like an old bear. And Jeff reached into his billfold and he came to this old crumpled up piece of paper. He had two lines underlined. As I'd asked him, I said, would y'all have much for brains when you got yourself into all this? Into this piece of paper, and I want to share it with you. Oh, it's a poem by Rudyard Kipling. And when Jeff was a very young boy, I gave him this poem, and I told him, Son, if you can live your life by this, you'll do all right. One part of the poem says, If you can make one heap of all your winnings, and risk it on one turn of pitch and toss. And lose and start again at your beginnings and never breathe a word about your loss. I finished reading this and I looked to Jeff and, and he said, Dad, I, I didn't just read your poem. I've lived it. You know, you can imagine as a dad that the boy looks at you and tells you something like that. You quit your snorting and fussing and fuming real quick. And so we sat down and tried to figure out how we could get ourselves out of this situation. If you can make one heap of all your winnings and risk it on one turn of pitch and toss and lose, start again at your beginnings. And never read, never breathe a word about your loss. Um, Bob, there's another point, another line in this poem, and I want to read it to you. If you can talk with crowds and keep your virtue, or walk with kings nor lose the common touch, if neither foe nor loving friends can hurt you, if all men count with you but none too much, 
If you can fill the unforgiving moment with 60 seconds worth of distant crying, yours is the earth and everything that's in it, and which is more, you'll be a man, my son. Well, acorns don't fall far from the tree, Bob, and, and I want to tell you that we're coming up on an unforgiving moment. And what I want you to know, Bob, is that um, I'm an old tree, and you are too, but I'm ready for the task. I'm ready for 60 seconds worth of distant run. Another thing, Bob, I want you to know that I'm mighty proud of my son. I can look at him, proud of what he's accomplished, and proud of all that he's become. I'm pretty proud that acorns don't fall very far from the tree. I hope you can say the same. I hope you can feel the same in your heart. And I hope you're ready for this unforgiving moment that we're about to go into. Thank you for the opportunity of being with you this morning. So let's take a time out there because we're going to listen to your promo too. But when you hear that back, your dad here, what, what, what do you think? See, you're going to get me emotional. <laughs> oh. It's scripted and oh man, Conrad. Oh, as we go through life, uh, why's that getting all over you today? I don't know. I really don't. It, it's a wrestling storyline, but, um, but your dad's talking about you and the acorn falling far from the tree. And well, the TNA story has a lot to do with that. Cause I gambled everything that went through my mind right then. And he gave me, Oh, man, I'm sorry. No, take your time, man. You're uh, fine. Um, I have no idea. Uh, he gave me that poem and I still got it. It's right out there. Um, and he also gave me the, uh, Roosevelt quote about it's not the credit that counts. And, um, he really did. I mean, I'd get so sick and tired of listening to the same kind of speech over and over. But as I go through life, <clears throat> that poem, it, it's a, he, it's a good one. And if by Rudyard Kipling, uh, and then that quote, I had Conrad, I have no idea why he got all of me, but you know, in a lot of ways, another thing that I just love about the industry, you, you look at Pat McAfee. I mean, that video really exists. He was a freaking all pro kicker and all that kind of stuff. But his dream was to, 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 Russell at WrestleMania. It came true. I got a lot. I got a shitload of respect for that. Um, but no, just my dad and those words and knowing that, you know, we've had our ups and downs, I think probably why it getting all over me, but all through the ups and downs, those, those, those life lessons that he would impress upon me are much more important today than they were back then. Um, Conrad, I really don't know why, uh, but because you love your dad, it. that's okay. Yeah, yeah, but I, you asked uh, what's, uh, what was your question? I'm trying to go back. I'm trying to get back on track, man. Um, you said, uh, well, how did that make me feel? Well, I could tell it made you feel, and I wanted to know why it made you feel. But you told us, and let's look. This is all part of the same segment. Let's, uh, let's finish the clip here. Meltzer says, this is maybe the best promo of your career at this point. <laughs> How true the saying is 
that acorns don't fall far from the tree. And Brian Gerard James, how true that thing is, especially in your case, because I know how useless, I know what a waste of space that you really are. And the people around here are sure finding that out awful quick. And Bob, now I know where he gets it from because you're just as rotten, you're just as dirty, and you're just as useless as your boy is. Because, yeah, you think you're real big and bad. Beating up on 65-year-old grandfathers. My grandfather. Well, Brian, it's finally come down to this. A lot's riding on this match. Oh, an awful lot. But the most important thing is, is that Double J gets the opportunity to show the world the difference in these two acorns. I get to show the world the difference between the Jarrett's and the Armstrong's. Oh, and I'm going to enjoy doing it. Because, Bob, when I get through with your boy, you're going to go right home down in Florida and you're going to oh, slap old Gail, your old lady, right in the mouth and say, ain't no way Brian came from my loins because I'm going to walk a mud hole in his butt and stomp it and walk it dry. Now, Brian, without a doubt, I can handle you. But Bob, you want to step in the ring? I'm personally giving you a little invitation. Because obviously, you don't know when my dad gets angry just how big and bad. He's not big in stature, but what he's got, he's got right here. I'm 242 pounds, and I can bench press two of my dad. But I would rather be in a pit full of rattlesnakes than have to fight him when he gets angry, and he's angry. So, Bob... You bring all your boys. You bring Scotty, Stevie, Brad. I don't care who you bring because I'm ready for the challenge. I'm ready for the task. I'm ready for the unforgiving moment, for the 60 seconds of distant run. And you don't even know what my dad's talking about, but I sure as hell do. So you get ready because old Double J, <laughs> I can't wait for that match because you're going to find out how big and bad Double J is. And that's J-E, double F, <laughs> J-A, double R-E, double T. That's Double J, Jeff Jarrett, the world's greatest singer, Road Dog, the world's greatest entertainer, and without a doubt, when this match is over, the world's greatest wrestler. <laughs> so there you go. We went from really real with you listening to your dad, and then you just got to hear your stuff. And yeah, I, I, I didn't care for that, but <laughs> I could tell and you were we, like, oh gosh. God. Let's move on. Um, you, you hate know, watching your old stuff, don't you? Because you just oh, think, man, I could have done that so much better now. Right? Yes, 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 and yes. Um, yeah, I don't, and Brian on his podcast, he'll get into his uh, his, his uh, relationship with his dad. That that their bond was really cool. And I was just thinking through that, you know, when when Bullet got sick, Brian moved him in. So he he spent his final days at Brian's house, and their bond and cool story uh but wow conrad let's get back on track here pal you uh you asshole i know i always get you with your dad uh eventually the blow off is uswa and smoky mountain uh against jerry jarrett's house and he's at ringside <laughs> but it only draws 520 fans in memphis you get the win it's a rubber match Meltzer would say they ran shows in memphis on the 22nd and the 27th over this past week the 22nd was an experiment to see how moving away from the traditional Monday would draw since 1120 against Nitro and raw, which was a loaded show that was free. Well, that looks like suicide. Plus on Wednesday, Jerry Lawler would be available. So the Wednesday of Thanksgiving weekend is traditionally the number one travel day of the year. So it's not the best night to draw fans to entertainment events as the rest of the weekend is. But the crowd was up significantly estimated at 1,150 fans, which still isn't good considering they did the whole promotion step, but it's kind of ironic now that Smoky Mountain's closing up. Jesse James Armstrong this time beat Jeff Jarrett to set up the 1127 match where Jerry Jarrett would put up his million dollar home in Hendersonville 
so he could get his company back. And Jerry Jarrett brought in, was brought in to be Jeff in Jeff's corner with Bob Armstrong and his son's corner, a combination of going against the free shows. We're talking about not right nitro and raw here. And that angle just being way too far fetched led to the smallest house in years, 520 fans paying $4,100 with Jarrett winning and gaining possession of smoky mountain, whatever that even means. Brad Armstrong, who had lost the SMW title two nights earlier, appeared with the belt as champion and was disqualified earlier in the show. When SMW had control over the promotion, so to speak, Bob Armstrong fired Lance Russell. However, Jarrett rehired him at the end of the show when his son regained possession of the promotion. So this is actually the end of Smoky Mountain Wrestling. Did you know that going in that, hey, they're going to they're going to be closing up shop anyway. Let's turn it into an angle. No, I, I don't recall that. I'm not saying that Randy and Jim Cornette, Randy Hales and Jim Cornette didn't have those conversations and knew that maybe the, the financial, uh, outlook at Smoky Mountain. I don't really recall all that. Um, no, uh, you know, th- when you can look at it 20 years later, she's just 25 years later. Um, we tried that Thanksgiving experiment. I remember that we're splitting our house. We're trying to do everything. I mean, I, I don't think it's long after this, that, that we, we move buildings and all that, but man, it was really, really, uh, the territory as a, in, in totality was in a lot of ways on life support from what it was. So talk to me a little bit about your dad's house. It's become this famous thing. Everybody talks about it to this day. It's fun in the context of being 1995 that your dad's house was a million dollar house. These days, 2022 real estate prices. What do you think your dad's old place would have been worth? Oh God. Do you remember the address of the big house? It, it sold multiple times, but 467. Yep. Cumberland Hills Drive. And uh 37075. It's just fun for me to think about back then. This is Conrad say with Conrad.com like expertise coming out like this. I can't wait to hear what you roll with here. Oh, I don't know what it is. I'm just oh, saying oh, I thought you were Googling it, uh, but no, I mean, oh, no, it, I'm looking at the house. It sold January of last year for 1.9, which is a lot less than I would have imagined. But by that point, your dad had chipped away a lot of the land, right? Yeah. So it was originally a hundred acres and it was, yeah, it's, it's it, the, the whole iteration of the properties radically changed, but he built it in, um, obviously in the, in the heyday, uh, 80, I think he started in 81 and finished in 83. Um, so it was, but uh, it shows on Zillow built in 82. So you're yeah. on the money, uh, 8.47 acres, over 10,000 square feet quite the place and it's become legendary. And you see, if you look at the listing now, boy, you'll see houses just all around it. It did not look like that back in the day. That was, was all just on 110 acres. Yes. yes. It was the last farm in the city of Hendersonville, the very last one. And, uh, yeah, it was, uh, stakes. We're, we're, we're doing it for the promotions. Now we're doing it for houses. Uh, and these, I guess are probably, you know, these matches, is this the first time you've been one-on-one against Brian? Yes. And that was something that, um, you know, obviously both young and I mean, we just had really, really, really good chemistry. He is so creative and so spontaneous and he's athletic. He's got it all. You know, a lot of people just kind of look at him as the mouthpiece and that's right. Oh, Oh, you didn't know. And ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls and all this over the weekend, we were reminiscing about all kinds of different things. And just, I mean, when we had the tag matches, me, Sean, Scott, Kevin, and him, uh, just the fun that we had, but his athletic ability is greatly, greatly, greatly overlooked. Um, Hey, something I want to mention too. everybody in our crew who had never met him before. I haven't even shared this with you, but literally to a person everyone, whether it's Dave Silva or Mike Dawkins or Cassio, they've all been helping behind the scenes, you know, helping him get ready yeah. and, and Ryan, and Ryan ready and all that. But this is their first time meeting him to a man, every single person, every single person, God dang, he's tall. Hey, 
sorry, but look, look at Scotty. A lot of people, Scott Armstrong. Yeah. Then, then, then Stevie was well, it Brad. Actually, it was Scotty, then Brad, then Steve, then Brian. They kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Like, like cell phone bars. Yes, sir. He, yeah. he exactly. He, and, um, they can all sing. They all got rhythm. Pep had it, but a bullet had it, but it, it's Brian is, is like, uh, yeah, it sounds like an infomercial here for him, but I mean, he, he's, he's, he's got, I mean, he just really has, and he's got to me, uh, I don't think the brothers, I mean, he's got the most charisma, like Brad was quick witted, but you had to really get behind baseball or inside baseball to know that in the locker room. Um, it's just what it was. Scotty and Stevie are dry sense of humor, great humor, but Brian just has a different sense of humor very outgoing and he can sing his ass off and work his ass off. But our matches, um, I enjoyed it. I mean, you know, we did that run with the WWA in Australia. Um, me and Brad just always had really, really good chemistry. I think at the end of the day, we both trusted each other on every level. And, and so we, we, we gelled well together. It's, uh, it's just fun to go back and, and, and think about what could have been, because we know this was supposed to be a, a feud and an angle, if you will, with different stakes and a different story in the WWF. Instead, it happens here. Um, it didn't quite do as well as you would have hoped, but I guess for years and years, a lot of folks were wondering what will turn Memphis around. And I don't think it was as much creative as it was. It was just time. Raw and Nitro. Yeah. The research that Derek did on this, kudos, shout out. But when you really look at the houses and knowing that the creative, okay, was it great? It's debatable. It wasn't bad. I, I'm going to get on myself by it, it was, it was two names known. And at the end of the day, we both had just come off WWF television with a few that was kind of open ended. Even your casual marks, if you follow wrestling, he calls me the intercontinental title. If you want to go down that road. I mean, so we were just hot off WWF TV. It did move the needle at all. Memphis was over. It just was, it was the minor leagues. It is well known. It was the, it was branded that way. You can just kind of look at even, I don't want to say other promotions, but you know, like watching Saturday and Sunday, you realize that's the grandest stage. And then there's the rest and there's no disrespect. Oh, all no. Good. no, no. Come on now. Anybody trying to compete with WrestleMania. I mean, that's a different thing. That, and that, and that's okay. It, yeah. It's just, but the, you know, you were, we're, we're tying it into this episode. Memphis was, <laughs> it was single a ball. Chat me up about Jim Cornette. You know, we, we didn't talk about him a lot when you were first getting, we did all the TNA episodes about how you were first making this a thing and going to create TNA. He had done that with Smoky Mountain. Did you talk to him before, during, after about, I don't know, armchair quarterbacking, maybe something he could have really tried to impart wisdom on you with, man, starting your own wrestling promotion, you can do whatever you want. But in my opinion, it's been my experience, I would make sure I. Did he drop any nugget like that on you? No. And I, again, um, the, 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 uh, well, Conrad, yeah, well, maybe not. I think you were born a, a brilliant businessman. I've, I've evolved, you know, I, I wish I would have what I'm saying is I didn't reach out to Jim, you know, when he was doing Smoky mountain, I was, you know, yes, the son of a promoter or, or grandson of, yeah, I, but I was talent only. And so we didn't have any conversations about the business side of things when he was actively running Smoky Mountain. And when I started TNA, I didn't have any, you know, deep dive discussions with him, which would have been great because for so many reasons, but I just didn't, I, I you know, I, I didn't, I'd, I'd taken my mental notes from WCW time and, uh, WWF at the time. And obviously the territory of the time and, uh, you know, diving into the pay-per-view component and all that and coming off the attitude there, but no short, short answer is no, I didn't reach out to him and probably should have. Um, did you watch much smoky mountain? We haven't spent a lot of time talking about smoky mountain. what do you think of smoky mountain and, and Cornette's brand of wrestling? If you will, 
I, I didn't. And I always heard the stories, you know, they do a big house in Knoxville and, you know, Knoxville's only 160, 70 miles. My little brother and sister went to college up there. I've been to ball games over there all my whole life, but never, it was, you know, actively involved in Smoky mountain. I know I was scheduled once or twice, but never, it, it never came about, but no, um, obviously I didn't get the program. And back in those days, you didn't have digital copies. So it would have been a VHS. So I just saw bits and pieces. On December 20th, you win the unified title from Ahmed Johnson and Tunica and Meltzer reports that you were both working as baby faces. Was this getting a trial run before the pay-per-view? Were you allowed to work USWA whenever you wanted as part of your deal? I mean, is that the gist? I'm literally trying to rack my brain and have been we got the note several days ago <clears throat> so you said the date was what december 20th december 20th so i believe i started back with the wwf at the december pay-per-view so it was right in that time frame yeah that's uh, why i was asking with the ahmed thing you're getting ready for you and ahmed on pay-per-view when you're yes. in tunica here so i just assume this i'm is wondering if i knew that in tunica i don't know I, I don't recall like that, the, the kind of, Hey Jeff, you're going to be working with, but, but that's why what, what the, here's what threw me off. I'm probably not finishing my thought. If I was getting ready, I think I would have at least worked a heel in the match. So his baby face versus baby face. I, I don't know. That was a disconnect to me. Um, uh, so was I getting ready for WWF matches or was I not? I don't know. <laughs> Ahmed Johnson had just wrestled Buddy Landell on pay-per-view three days prior uh, in Hershey, Pennsylvania. But we know that, you know, you're getting tuned up for the whole Royal Rumble thing. And anyway, Christmas night in Nashville in front of 860 fans, you defeat Brad Armstrong to get a lumberjack match with Bullet Bob. You win that one too. In Louisville the next night, you beat Bullet Bob in a lumberjack strap match and then Brian Christopher in the main event to keep the unified title. Two days after Christmas, you defeat Bullet Bob in another lumberjack strap match, and then Brian Christopher in front of 1,300 fans at the main event of the Mid South Coliseum show. Um, was Lawler involved in any of this as you're sort of playing hokey pokey? What was your involvement with Lawler at this point? I'm sure he was around. Doesn't sound like he was on the cards. I remember we took the lumberjack strap match around the, you know, and it's Christmas week, and we always, you know, those were. I don't want to say, well, back in the day, he was guaranteed to be, I don't want to say sellouts, but really good houses. Um, but uh, it sounded like the houses were up thousand folks in Nashville or 800 and whatever it was. Um, uh, those are all good houses. Lawler was doing his WWF deal best I recall, but you know, he was still, um, a, a big owner in the company. Your run in the USWA continues. We covered some of that in our previous episodes when you got hurt in your match with Ahmed. Uh, you did wrestle a couple more times here in the USWA with Sir Mo in April. Uh, you guys would lose to Vader and Brian Christopher. You would team with Goldust to beat Christopher and Doug Gilbert. And then you would lose to Sid by DQ. We'll discuss the, the end of USWA in another episode. But what a crazy time this was to see both of the double J's against each other. Maybe once upon a time we were doing a Millie Vanilli storyline. Now it's Smoky Mountain versus USWA. It's Armstrong's versus Jarrett's. It's uh, promotion versus promotion, house versus promotion. We had some fun stakes here back then, did we not? Yes, we did. You know, uh, you you brought up. I'm just trying to think the different what ifs. What ifs Monty Brown would have re-signed long term and he'd become world champion. The what ifs. Um, you know, if, if it would have been cemented that I would have been not a horseman, but the horseman, uh, you know, you, you want to keep taking jabs at that, but no, the, 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 what ifs me and Brian had worked our story on WWF TV, you know, the, what, what if, how, how, how would that have gone? Had we not walked out, how would that have gone down? Would we have had a one and done? Would we have had a three match trilogy? Would we have maybe got back together just kind of those what ifs, but, um, yep. It played, played out exactly the way it was supposed to play out. Uh, lessons learned some promos in there about Oaks and acorns, um, on that YouTube clip, Conrad, when, when that was playing, were you, were you watching the YouTube clip? Of course I was. Okay. So, the two things when I watch, look back and research, 
you almost have to say, yep, he's in the South because in his, in, in the, in the background was guns everywhere, guns everywhere. And his golf clubs, <laughs> yes. guns and golf clubs. I'm like, boy, Jerry's just man about town. Yes. Oh, I, that's, that was in the office that he just turned the camera. He wasn't going anywhere. Yeah. Just set the camera up right here. So we're going to be talking about, uh, something fun next week, Jeff. I can't believe this is real, but our 50th episode is next week. Wow. 50 episodes in, we're going to be talking about the first ever. Oh boy. All cage match pro wrestling show. It's lockdown 2005. Where did this idea come from? Who was for it? Who was against it? How did dusty sell it? The six sides of steel team Nash of Kevin Nash, Sean Waltman and diamond Dallas page taking on team Jarrett. It's yourself, Monty Brown and the outlaw. Why Kevin Nash didn't make the show abyss versus AJ styles and a number one contender match. Christopher Daniels is going to defend his X division title against Elix Skipper. America's most wanted is going to go up against team Canada in a strap match, man. There's so many gimmick matches here. Plus, unfortunately the last pro wrestling match of Chris Candido so much more lockdown. Oh, five is going to be an interesting topic, my friend. So that's Oh five. So 16, 17 years ago, and you just rattled off some names. And I thought as you were going through, I saw Chris Daniels this weekend and look at his position in the business, uh, you know, team Canada, um, you mentioned at the end of the episode, Vader and gold dust and Vader went into the hall of fame. God rest his soul. And Cody and Dustin and all the different names, you know, just how it weaves in and out the, the it's, I love this business. But uh, this episode is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, you know, there's going to be a component with uh, Mole Man. Uh, his his contributions to Lockdown 05, I'll, w- I'll save that till next week. It's going to be fun. Um, Conrad, I had a couple of folks in line this week, more than a couple of folks. They came up and were, of course, you know. If you're going to say anything about Desperate Housewives, I'm going to hang up on you. Conrad. That, I'm just telling that, you now, we're going to end the show. That, that, Andre, that, that, that argument is over because okay, okay. you were a witness to it. You were a witness to it. There's loads, loads and loads of Desperate Housewives fans. And there's also folks, uh, you saw that Titans jersey I got. Uh, it, it had a number four on it. Uh, and uh, so that's, you know, signifying that I'm not a four horseman. I'm the four horseman. Uh, but uh, all kidding aside, people said, man, we love the TNA episodes of getting granular. And, and, and I said, how old are you? He goes, I'm 33. And when I start thinking this one particular guy, I go, okay. You know, he, he's, he's, he said, that was right in the middle of my fandom. And he went down a list. I mean, Sonny Siaki, I mean, he named a long list. So the TNA episodes, as we get into them, uh, and we have in the past, Gosh, we're on 50. They're a lot of fun. So I'm looking forward to the next week. It's going to be an interesting time to say the least, because, uh, TNA and O five, man, they weren't necessarily a small promotion, but they weren't necessarily a big promotion. It's uh, a little bit everything. And that's what I like about this show. I also like that as a part of what we do, Jeff, for adfreeshows.com, you get all these shows early and ad free, but tonight as people are listening to this, uh, Tuesday. April 5th, we're going to be sitting down and by we, I mean, myself and Ric Flair, we're going to be watching his WrestleMania eight match with the macho man, Randy Savage. You're invited to join us as well. That's right. You can zoom in and be a part of a conversation with Ric Flair about one of his more memorable WrestleMania matches for the WWF world championship. It's the nature boy defending against the macho man. You know, the story, she was mine first miss Elizabeth's in the middle. Great WrestleMania moment, great WrestleMania match. We're going to relive it just as a, a WrestleMania hangover, if you will, tonight at adfreeshows.com. It should be a lot of fun, Jeff. You know, ad free um, and, and other things coming up. I just exchanged emails with some folks to finalize. Um, old Double J, circa 1990s ish, uh, the uh, Young Rock. Um, we're going to be having uh, Mr. James Bolton is his name. He plays double J he's an Australian actor. He's also an Australian independent wrestler. 
Uh, and we're going to be having him a part of ad free shows coming up. we got to get that scheduled with the crew. So ad free, uh, as, uh, Karen was at the table this weekend and having conversations and saw the different handouts we were given the advertisements and a one month free and with a purchase and all this kind of stuff, it really, in her mind, she, she, it took, it's taken a while, but she was like, I said, honey, I've been telling you, and I mean this, and I've said this many times, not many more times, not on this show, uh, off, off this show. It is by far the best value in sports entertainment because of the access. I mean, the nature boy, and I don't want to get into numbers, but folks, do you know what Rick charges? I shouldn't say that should I cut kind of rant for a personal appearance, but I mean the access for Shivani, Jim Ross, Kurt Angle, Eric Bischoff, on and on. And every week, um, there's, there's something, uh, to get inside baseball and, you know, at the very lowest uh, of the level early and ad free for God's sakes, folks, some people just love that as well. So, uh, check out the nature boy on ad free. It's going to be fun. Join us later tonight. Adfreeshows.com. You get to uh, interact with the nature boy until next week where we're talking all things lockdown. Oh five. I am a, Hey, Hey, it's Conrad. He is Jeff Jarrett and we will see you next week right here on my world. Peace. Hey, Hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell. So you can notice anytime we upload some new content and go save yourself some money right now. If you're in a 30 year loan or you have credit card debt, it's not a matter of if I can save you money. It's a matter of how much find out right now for free at savewithconrad.com.